I'm Wyatt Cash for FedScoop TV, and uh, we're here at the Federal Forum with uh, Lloyd Carney, CEO of Brocade, and uh, here to talk about the evolution of um, and really the need for the modernization of networks. And um, so thanks for joining us, Lloyd. Um, Thank you. I'd like to just start briefly with what, what are some of the factors you see that are driving IT growth and innovation in general, and then how does the network fit into that? Well, you know, you've seen innovation at the server level and at the storage level in, in almost um, exponential. You look at the ability to store, the ability to compute, uh, you know, what you pay for a gigabyte of storage now versus, you know, five years ago, even for your home cameras or devices, mm -hmm. the storage price have dropped to the floor. So that, that has vastly improved your ability to how much you can store, how much you choose to store. The compute level, uh, you've got multi-core machines from Intel that, you know, has driven down the, 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 the price points on your servers. And your servers now are as, as powerful as, you know, small computers from 10 years ago. And that's the kind of, mm -hmm. you know, change you've seen. We've not seen that change in network layer. Um, because, quite frankly, it's been dominated by, you know, a single vendor and we've not taken advantage of some of the, you know, the, 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 the price curve on, on, the, on the ASIC front. So now Intel has joined the networking game and Intel is changing that because mm -hmm. you can now run networking software on an Intel platform. Whereas before you had to run it on an ASIC from, you know, Juniper or Brocade or Cisco, which is an expensive, you know, platform, dedicated platform, you can now run those networking functions as virtual machines on Intel platform for you know 20% the hardware price mm -hmm. or you know 15% hardware price. So that is a next driving function. Virtualization in that, in, in in the data center, which you know, the big wave came with you know uh, VMware's um, Hyper V and you've got Microsoft with their own virtualization platform. That dramatically changed what a server looks like and what compute looks like in the data center. And that virtualization now is coming down to the network layer. And so you're going to see the same kind of dynamic, you know, cost differential, functionality increase at the network layer that you saw at the, at the server level. So just a next, next logical step virtualization. Mm -hmm. You mentioned you were meeting with uh, generals at the various branches of the Defense Department, giving you an indication of what it's going to take to modernize uh, both military and civilian government agencies. What's your take on these? this uh, IT trend and where do you see the federal government um, being able to respond and take advantage of that? Well, the first thing they've done is you know, they've reached out to the private sector and to the people like Tony Scott who's coming in, come in as CIO. Um, he, he brings a perspective having been CIO of VMware and, 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 and Microsoft that is but it's, it's not unique, but it is, it, it is a refreshing way of looking at the problem not having you know been been kind of you know sourced on the, mm -hmm. on the, in the beltway so he's the, he, so he his thought process is one around you know green 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 space new technologies new methodologies that will end up providing a more efficient solution mm -hmm. a more secure solution and a, and a more open solution which will give him opportunity to bring in best of breed solutions to help solve problems because the problems that, that he's being faced a, he doesn't know what he doesn't know yet. You know, mm. there, there are nation states that have been attacking our infrastructure for years. There are intrusion devices that are buried in our infrastructure that are dormant, waiting to be turned on. Mm. There are ones that are turned on. So he has to figure out how to, how to shut down the ones that are, that are there today that he's finding out. Every week you hear about something that has been, been found and, and it, the breaches are not, you know, we found it this morning and it's been, you know, it, it, been impacting us for two days, we shut it down. No, it's been there for a year and a half, mm. and we now need to go figure out how to, you know, A, what they stole over the past year and a half and shut it down. So he needs to, to shut those down, and then he needs to figure out what's buried that hasn't been turned on as yet, and figure out how to, you know, um, eliminate that threat. So, and it, 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 it's, it's counterintuitive when you think about it, but an open architecture actually gives it more flexibility mm -hmm. because he can reach out and find the best solution to go and detect those hidden devices um, because their company is spinning up all along the Beltway here um, you know, with really smart people who are trying to figure out how to defend this infrastructure and their best of breed solutions coming up. New threats are coming up, being identified, and he has to be able to respond to those threats quickly. If he has a locked, hardened architecture and mm -hmm. he's been shipping, you know, here's what we define it to be five years ago, we'll be shipping this for the next 10 years, Let's go to the next problem. No, he can't do it anymore. Anything he's shipping, 
he has to be agile. He has to be able to make, you know, instantaneous changes in architecture to solve for, you know, known threats and evolving threats. And that is what a, you know, software-defined networking architecture gives you. That's what network function virtualization gives you. An open architecture gives you that flexibility. Mm -hmm. So you're on the board of Visa. Mm -hmm. Brocade serves a lot of the financial industry. What mm -hmm. could you advise federal CIOs and the IT community within government of some best practices that you're seeing in that realm, particularly as it relates to the network layer? Well, for, for all, the, all the financials, um, you know, they're, they're deploying machine learning. They're, mm. they're deploying tools that measure what is normal behavior. Mm -hmm. And so they, they, they run analysis that will determine when they see aberrant behavior. Um, now, that, that is part of the solution. Um, they also work hard at verifying you know, users who come into their enterprise and limiting access to that to those customers, and also ensuring that you know they encrypt aggressively. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, they, they encrypt as much as possible. So the bad guys do get in. They get you know, it's a hard time to, to figure out what the heck they, they, they put their hands on. So, so there is best practice. They're virtualizing aggressively because it gives them flexibility. You know, to, in, in a virtual platform, uh, an, an issue comes up. You know, you get, you know, Linux um, developers, you know, people with, with expertise in, in security, you can crunch away for a couple of days, solve a problem, deploy it. Traditional network, uh, you know, it takes, can take months, mm. you know, just to go and find the equipment, you know, pull the equipment out the field versus, you know, I can inline do this upgrade, software push to the device, upgrade the device, and uh, you know, problem to solve. And mm -hmm. so there's a whole different mentality that they that they have about, you know, they, they yes they have traditional firewalls, but they also assume that the threat's already there, and they spend a lot of time and effort ferreting out the threat within and trying to um, eliminate that threat. Well, Lloyd, thank you for being with us uh, today, and uh, you can read more about these topics and others uh, at FedScoop.com.